making a power talk on the Sermon of the Mount, which I've called Outrageous Love. It wasn't the first title that really popped in my head, but by the time I'd finished, I thought, this is about outrageous love that we have for others because our Father loves us in that amazing, unconditional, radical way. And we've been looking at standards, really, for Christian living, haven't we? And we learn that actually they're, they're really good standards, but they're actually quite hard to live by sometimes. Um, but we can't do it without the power of God's Holy Spirit, can we? And I think that's what we've been learning on this journey over the last few weeks, haven't we? Which is really good. Um, I know Annie's going to be really helpful to me and um, put the... Thank you. <laughs> I'll have to remember to wave to you. So we're looking at the portion of scripture from Matthew chapter 5, verses um, really 43 to 48. Uh, But verse 44 says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Uh, And we, this is, I will apologise, because there'll be some similarities to last week's talk with with Rob as well. So there is a little bit of... of, um, blurring over but it's some different slight differences but it's always good to be reminded isn't it and um, we looked a little bit at verses from the earlier part of this scripture Matthew 5 verse 10 where it says blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and blessed when people blessed are you when people insult you or persecute you or say false things about you because of me and it says rejoice when this happens I don't know about you, but I find that difficult. Rejoice when you're insulted, because great is your reward in heaven. And we learned a bit last week about turning the other cheek, walking the extra mile, doing, going the extra, didn't we? And we learned a little bit about how the, the teachers of the time, the scribes and the Pharisees, had distorted the Old Testament law. Um, so we've got it where it talks about, the Old Testament talks about neighbours and enemies and how to treat them. And we know that in Leviticus it's talked about, you know, if your neighbor's ox has gone astray, then bring it back to them. But it also says the same about if your enemy's ox has gone astray, bring it back to them. If your neighbor is hungry and thirsty, feed them. If your enemy is hungry or thirsty, feed them. It says actually the same thing. But the the teachers had distorted this, and they were sort of saying, well, we know who our neighbor is. That's our loved ones, our family those that live nearby, those in our location, but therefore it doesn't say anything else really about our enemies, so we can hate them, they're a bit beyond us. Um, And they distort the true meaning. So Jesus is once again challenging with this counterculture, no, 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 you're to love your enemies and you know, respond differently when they insult you or persecute you. We do see a bit more of this example when we look at um, Luke, Chapter 10, where there's that parable about the Good Samaritan, where the, there's an there's a interpretation of what you're, who is my neighbour, and the Good Samaritan, the Samaritans were considered to be aliens, strangers, enemies. But it's, you know, who is the person that's helping you? That's, you know, who are you helping? Anybody is your neighbour. So he clarifies this, and he's challenging that belief, and he's saying, no, love your enemies. And what we're actually to hate is what goes against God's principles. We're to hate things that, that make the world a dreadful place, the evil. We hate that, but not individuals with spite or vindictiveness. And instead, we're being challenged to be fired with love for God's honour and glory. And this is the love that it just doesn't come naturally always. We don't love everyone, do we? I find it quite easy to love you all, because I know, or hope, that you all love me. You know, you're my friends. I can love my family, because, you know, they love me. But to love somebody else that's perhaps doing dreadful things or hurting you or insulting you, that's not so easy, is it? And we're being challenged about that. And it goes on to say in verse 46, if you only love those that love you, that's easy. What reward will you get? Even others do that. Everybody does that. What more are you doing than others? Be perfect like your heavenly father. And um, Lynn's just really done a great example for me. Thank you. I didn't need to preach after that, Lynn. That's great. (laughs) 
It's natural for us to repay good with good, isn't it? And, of course, the Old Testament law was an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, you know. So it's like, well, they did that to me, so I'm going to do that to them. And if they think I'm going to have that, you know, they can have that back. You know, that sort of attitude. That's actually more our, our norm or our human natural, isn't it? But Jesus is saying, no, 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 this standard that I'm setting you, it's, it's not, that's not good enough. It's not enough. You to go above and beyond. You know... God created us and he loves us whatever we may do. However ugly we get or whatever we do, he still has that radical, unconditional, extreme capacity to love us. It doesn't matter. And he's saying, be perfect. Be like your heavenly father, like that. You also imitate Christ and show that super love. Wow. And this is what I'm saying. These are really good standards, but you know, you and I, we struggle with that, don't we? So that's why we can't do it in our own strength. We need the Holy Spirit power to, to strengthen us and to empower us and to, to make us bold about it. One of my favorite films is a, is a youngster. Uh, oh, I'm not onto that yet, but thank you, Anne. I'm nearly there. My favourite film, Crossing the Switchblade, um, which was uh, in the film with David, David Wilkerson, who um, founded Teen Challenge. He was a penniless, poor pastor who felt the need and the burden to go and pray and change the lives of the, of the, of the drug s- state in, in New York. And one of my favourite bits of the film is where, you know, Nicky Cruz... I'll tell you a secret, played by Eric Estrada, who I was in love with (laughs) as a (laughs) ten-year-old. He approaches um, Pastor David and he says, I could cut you into a hundred pieces, what you're saying. (laughs) It's not very good acting, is it? And David Wilkerson must have been petrified. If that had been me, a drug baron, off his head with a knife... You'd be like, whoa. I've just remembered, actually. I was threatened with a knife once, actually. Do you know, God's amazing, isn't it? You forget these. <laughs> Somebody threatened me with a knife and said, I-, I want you to do my homework for me in, in college. And I said, oh, no, forget that. I'm not doing your work for you. And he pulled a knife out at me. So um, being young and naive, I just laughed and walked off. <laughs> but, you know, um, that's God, isn't it? Anyway, back to this. David Wilkerson said, and every piece you cut me up into will say, I love you. Where did that come from? Where did he manage to get those words out? We'd be trembling, wouldn't you? But he had the power of the Holy Spirit in him, didn't he? And of course, and many of you know the end of that story. Nicky Cruz became um, an incredible convert and, and still preaches it to this day. He spent hours, though, David Wilkerson, hours flat out on his back, praying. And I think it's really important for us to remember as Christians, when we talk about doing these things, we can't do them in our own strength. And, you know, prayer, uh, and, uh, and, well, you know, I, I know that some individuals in the congregation are fasting at the moment as well. So I've been a bit challenged about that. Prayer and fasting on our back for some time, or on your knees, or on your face, or just wherever you're comfortable. Prayer and fasting, you know, waiting on God, and being filled with the Holy Spirit, it changes things, doesn't it? An incredible breakthrough. It did penetrate the streets, that did. Um, yeah, we'll go on to the next slide. Another example that um, affected my life personally, I don't know if any of you know this person. This is John Mosey and his daughter, Helga. Helga was a friend of mine, and in 1988, she was on the, um, the aeroplane the that got bombed over Lockerbie, and she died. And um, she'd been at home for a few days just before Christmas and was flying back to do au pair in. Um, she was the same age as me, so she'd have been nearly 19, I think. And she died because of the terrorist bombing. And her father and mother, John and Lisa Mosey, distraught, and her brother, distraught. But they forgave the bomber, you know. And... Um, John Mosey said, as far as we are concerned, the bombers are forgiven. Unforgiveness is not an option as a Christian. And he'd seen Helga's open Bible where she'd been reading it before she left. And it was open at Romans 12 verse 21. 
and he vowed to spread this message. Don't become overcome by evil, but overcome evil by doing good. And he took that to heart and has since gone around, he's preached for decades since then, preaching that message that we will not be overcome by evil, we will repay it with good. And even in the courts, I mean, originally they got the wrong guy, but he said, we forgive, we forgive. And he's influenced, he's met world leaders and politicians and he's influenced and spoke out. And they've kept that message true to witness because that's what Helga would have wanted. They did get some compensation and they used the money to open up orphanages in, uh, an orphanage in, in the Philippines because that was what was close to Helga's heart. Amazing forgiveness. They prayed for the terrorists, which is part of that verse, isn't it? It says, pray for those that persecute you. They prayed. You know, Paul, while he's encouraging the early church in, in 1 Peter, says he's talking to them because they've been suffering all sorts of trials. And, and he's saying, you've, you've gone through lots of trials and persecution, but this is proven genuine faith, which is, which is, great, is of greater worth than gold, gold refined in the fire and this results in the salvation of your souls and goes on to say that even angels long to understand what it is that you're going through and what you're doing and what you've gained even angels long isn't that amazing so our next slide i've actually put you know persecution and i'm not going to take this lightly for us in this country it perhaps means a bit more like being got at being mocked being insulted and I'm going to just mention here that, you know, worldwide, there is persecution still going on. Somebody said to me the other day, um, I, I, is that still going on? Somebody got ex executed for their faith. Is that still going on in the world? Yes, it is. In this country, we're very unaware sometimes of what goes on. Many of you I know will receive stories like Open Doors, and um, the stories of, of women in Iran or Afghanistan. In Afghanistan at the moment... Um, you know, the, the officials are knocking on the doors, looking at people's phones, looking to see if you're a Christian. And particularly women are very vulnerable at the moment. You know, people are tortured and executed for their faith today. This is very real. So we do take a moment to pray for those, don't we? And we know there's terrible things going on in the Ukraine as well at the moment. You know, it is devastating. So here, when we look at this um, in the UK, um, we're probably not quite as aware and we're probably looking at this in a slightly different light. So just be careful that we balance this out, you know, carefully. When we're got at, it does provide us an opportunity for witness. When someone insults you or mocks you. You know, even sometimes... Um, Living with a commitment to righteousness, if you live a righteous life, that can even be an insult unwittingly to those that you mix with. Some people don't know what it is they don't like about you, and it's perhaps something in their soul or their spirit that's not quite balancing with what's in your spirit, and they don't know sometimes why they're a bit irritated with you. They don't, they don't know why they don't like what you say sometimes. But you know, when things happen, and the way we respond to how people hurt us or insult us, it provides an opportunity for our witness, for our life, and for our testimony, our story. We can say, well, actually, um, I'm not going to respond to that because I have actually got a story to tell you. It demonstrates our, our values and behaviours, doesn't it? Who we are, and we're learning what our values and behaviours are today and for the past few weeks, how we live. And again, that word prayer, pray for those that persecute you. So prayer is a powerful way to help others. And using practical acts of love and kindness often um, light the way for those who would seek to demean. Um, things like, I know so many of us have perhaps been upset or insulted. Uh, I, my sister was telling me a story recently where she'd been, had a bit of a, an argument over the garden fence. And she felt a bit bad about it afterwards, and she went around with a bunch of flowers to apologise and said, that's, that's not really who I am, I'm sorry. And the woman burst into tears, and they had a really helpful conversation after that. And it's just little things like that, isn't it? So when you wonder, what can I do? That's just a little thing, isn't it, you know, we can do. 
There was another example a couple of weeks ago. We had a baptism on the beach, and it was fantastic, but it was very cold. And there's a group of the church, it was different, not this church, obviously, it was a different church, and um, I was on the sidelines, and this, this chap came up and started to heckle and shout at us and sh- said we should be ashamed of ourselves having this open-air celebration and when there's other things going on in the world and what's your God doing about this and, and that. Really was quite, he was really quite wound up and shouting and you know, <laughs> it was a bit of an odd moment as people are going in and out to see it getting baptised and it stopped the proceedings for a moment as people thought, oh. But you know what happened? And, as, and I, you know, because it wasn't my church, I was able to just be a bystander and watch this myself. The, the, the people in the church, they just started to, en masse, move down the beach. <laughs> and the baptism started to move down the beach, down the sea. There's plenty of sea, isn't there? And then somebody rushed around, my, my new niece-in-law rushed around and said, sing up, everybody, sing up. <laughs> so we could drown it out. And then another man from the um, congregation came towards this gentleman and started to talk to him and draw him to the side and listen to what he'd got to say. And he started to listen and, and calm things down. And uh, we got on. It was like, it's, it's sort of weird. Some of us are quite used to that sort of behaviour. I can see visitors in the back there. Some of us are used to that sort of behaviour, you know, but others are not. And... Um, Interestingly enough, there was somebody standing in that crowd who I know very well now, who, who was not a Christian at that moment. But watching on, he was so impressed by how that was handled that he has since become a Christian. <laughs> Isn't that amazing, thank God? That's just amazing. And there were people in the cafe at the top that were texting and saying, who are those people on the beach? There's lovely singing. It's wonderful to see these people out doing this thing. So although there was one man who was a bit insulted by this, there were a lot of people that were um, moved and emotionally uplifted by this. Isn't that amazing? Just a simple church doing their simple, obedient thing, getting baptised, showing a witness, an outdoor witness. It's amazing, isn't it? And they were so kind to that gentleman. I mean, unfortunately, that gentleman was actually under a lot, was actually driving his car with children, young children in his car under the effects of alcohol. So somebody did actually report him and he did get stopped by the police. And as we drove by, we prayed for him. <laughs> so bless him. Let's pray, pray. I do pray that his life is changed, but we, we pray, don't we? You know, Marta from YWAM on Thursday evening, some of you were there at the Thy Kingdom Come event. Um, she passionately reminded us about this, that there are many countries where there's real persecution going on. And she said, here in the UK, there's no reason for us not to be bold and to step out in faith and to share this unconditional, outrageous love that God has given us. And when I thought about, well, in terms of my message this morning, when you are insulted or mocked, repay that with something else. And um, we see that um, Jesus is our ultimate example for this. You know, Jesus was mocked, he was spat on, he was beaten, he was tortured, he was wrongly accused, and he willingly allowed it. It, This is not a sign of weakness. He was a strong man who had mighty, he had the power of heaven behind him. But his love for others was so powerful that he rejected retaliation and he went willingly through those things. You know, there are many that loved Jesus, many that hated him. And because he challenged the, challenged the leaders of the day, and it was also God's purpose, he went to that cross. His message is love. It's not to ignore injustice or wrongdoing, but it's to forbid revenge. You know, justice is still important. And it's not a sentimental love, but it's radical. And it's an active desire for others to do good and to share the gospel. Going above and beyond. We were said, what are you doing? Go above and beyond. You know, this is a concept that um, we have in my organization where someone's worked really hard and you can nominate them for an award if you think they've gone above and beyond their job role. They've really helped, really been kind. doesn't seem to give them any more money, but uh, um, they might get a certificate. Yeah? That's good. 
But this is much more, isn't it? It's about when you are insulted and walked over. You know, you, you stand up, you're strong and full of courage, but you then respond. It's actually harder sometimes to do that, isn't it? But he says, Jesus said, this behavior marks you out as sons and daughters of the heavenly father. And it demonstrates spiritual maturity and that you're totally engaged with the will of God. So how do we do this, you know? Uh, Nick Gumbel gives us some um, really nice, simple guidelines. He says we're to love others regardless of their opinion, their background, their culture, or what they might have done. We pray for them. It's, it's, you know, when you, sometimes, how many times you don't know what to do with a situation, do you? I don't know what to do. I, I've tried everything. I've been, you know, I've been nice. I've done this. Like, you know, sometimes all you can do is pray. And prayer does change things. Bless them with words, encouragements. Bless them. And reply to, to insults with compliments. We're told, aren't we, in Proverbs that a gentle answer turns away wrath. And most of all, we follow Jesus' example who said on the cross, Father, forgive them. He showed outstanding, outstanding courage and strength when he was on that cross dying. And he said, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. And sometimes people don't know what they're doing. Sometimes they do. And we're to forgive them. Um, I'm going to ask the, the worship team to come and join me again. I've just got one thing I'd just like to share. I had a bit of a picture last week. Um, God showed me where somebody was washing their hands, and I felt like God said, you're washing your hands and doing nothing with it. Now, in my world, washing my hands means I'm about to prepare to do something. So when I wash my hands, I'm usually going to make tea for the family, or, or no, no, not usually, I don't make tea very often now, do I, Martin? I'm going to make some food. <laughs> Or I'm at work and I'm going to wash my hands because I'm going to put my sterile gloves on and I'm going to you know, do a dressing or I'm going to do some intervention that's going to relieve discomfort or pain. So I'm preparing to do something. And I feel like God's saying, you're washing your hands as if you're in readiness to do something and then you're not doing it. So I feel like it might be that it, some, somebody here needs to perhaps do something to say sorry to somebody, even if perhaps it wasn't your fault. You might need to go and make something right. There might be a situation with another person that you want to go and make it right. But you're struggling to. You're getting ready to go, ready to do it. And you've got, you know, you've prayed about it, you've got your heart right, and you're just sorting it out. But you're not quite making it out the door, or not quite making it there. So uh, if this is for you, I just pray that, you know, you, you will just be, feel emboldened. You will have to be empowered. And if you're struggling, Hebrews chapter 4 says, Go to the throne of God. Um, our God, who is full of grace and mercy, will help you in these times. So if you're struggling, go and ask for help. Pray and go. Thank you.